Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn with you with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Ezekiel. And we're in chapter 16. We're going to read again. We This is the longest chapter in Ezekiel. So we're breaking in at verse 22. And we will read down to verse 34. And so it begins this way. And um, by way of title, I'm just going to say this. Uh, two really words, insatiable and unsatisfied. <laughs> insatiable and unsatisfied. And that, of course, is is the story of sin, <laughs> that if we give into it, it is insatiable, but it never satisfies. And that's the story that uh, Judah are going to experience in this particular section. So beginning in verse 22, it says, And in all thine abominations... And thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, when thou wast naked and bare, and was polluted in thy blood. And it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God, that thou hast built up unto thee an eminent place, and has made thee an high place in every street. Thou hast built the high place at every head of the way, and has made thy beauty to be a board, and hast opened thy feet to every one that passed by, and multiplied thy whoredoms. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I have stretched out my hand over thee and have diminished thine ordinary food and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou was unsatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldest not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and has not been as an harlot in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. They gave, give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the country is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereunto, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. Well, I want to just say this is, uh, this is part of the scriptures that the rabbis did not want to be read publicly. <laughs> and you can understand why. Yeah, it's very graphic in its descriptions, and it really lays out just how bad Judah had become. And so we'll notice in verse 22, it kind of is the root cause of all of their uh, uh, whoredom, all of their, as it were, prostituting themselves. It all comes down to verse 22. In all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, Thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. This is the root cause of all their trouble, their ingratitude and their thoughtlessness because of what we had seen last time, all that the Lord had done for them, finding them in their, uh, in their nakedness, in their, as a kind of a helpless baby, and taking them and making them beautiful and working with them and everything the Lord had done for them, and they 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 forgot it. They forgot all of his blessing. Uh, and so they were filled with ingratitude. So busy with their unfaithfulness and their idolatry, they hadn't time or inclination to remember her past 
and what the Lord had done. Israel's haughty pride was rooted in their failure to remember. They no longer remembered their poor and humble beginnings and how all the protection, provision, and adornment they enjoyed was the blessing and gift of God who had done so much for them. And I suppose really what they had failed to do was what the psalmist says in Psalm 40. And I, I just love this psalm, Psalm 40, verse 2 and 3. This is, this is really what will keep any of us from going astray if we really get a hold of this truth. If we get a hold of what the Lord has done for us, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Do we realize the horrible pit we were once in? And out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and establish my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. And so basically, this is this is the problem. They've forgotten the, the horrible pit they were in. Uh, they've forgotten what the Lord has done in elevating them and putting their feet on a rock and, and being so good and gracious to them. And so again, we have to challenge our own hearts here. It's so easy, isn't it, to, to forget where we're from, to forget what the Lord has done for us. And may the Lord help us to ever remember. And that's part of the value. We've said this before, but it's worth repeating. The value of gospel preaching is that not only does it speak to lost sinners, it reminds those that are saved of what the Lord has done for them. And that's a good thing. And then, of course, the great value of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week is to bring to remembrance, call to mind what the Lord has done for us. And so these are very important things. And again, we just emphasize it because this is where all their problems came from. They'd forgotten. And so he says, Thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth when thou was naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood. You've forgotten all of that. Verse 23, it says, It came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God. And of course, it's a very serious thing when God pronounces a woe unto a people. Uh, the, the general principle found in the word of God is this, the way of the transgressor is hard. And so because of their failure to remember what the Lord has done for them, because of their persistent whoredoms, they're now experiencing the chastening of the Lord and they're, they're suffering uh, as a result of it. And so God pronounces this woe, woe unto them. And of course, it's a, it's a mixture of God's sorrowful lament over wicked Judah, but also it's a, it's a, a protest from the deepest feeling uh, from the heart of God, uh, partly threat, partly lament. Uh, it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 8, verse 13, there's another time when a, an angel flies through the heavens and says, woe, woe, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. <laughs> and again, it's a very somber thing when God pronounces these repetitions of the word woe against a nation. And so woe, woe, woe unto thee, it says, saith the Lord God, that thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place and has made thee an high place in every street. And so it wasn't that they were hiding their wickedness. They were putting it on display in every high place, every eminent, eminent means stand out. So it was like, there's, there's no shame. There's no hiding their sin. It's, it's absolutely on display. And that's the thought here. She devoted her buildings to idolatry. And uh, we're going to see in this little section that um, she's involved in uh, unfaithfulness to the Lord with various national entities. Uh, she's going to run after the Egyptians. She's going to run after the Assyrians. She's going to run after the Babylonians. And uh, as well as worshiping their gods, she's also going to turn to these nations to protect and defend her rather than the Lord, her husband. And so she's she's basically going to make alliances with these nations 
rather than her husband. So she builds this eminent place. Now the margin uh, in my Bible says uh, for eminent places, it says brothel houses. <laughs> uh, what a terrible statement. And, and so it carries the thought of whoredom. So she sets up these high places where she gets involved with idolatry and as well as with the idolatry always comes immorality. Uh, part of the appeal of the Canaanite worship and the worship of all the false gods was that a lot of them were connected to fertility and along with the worship went kind of sexual misconduct of the of the most horrendous type and so of course very appealing to the flesh and so they certainly got involved with this they made rooftop shrines to the various deities that they were enamored with and then they conducted themselves in vile ways in fact verse 25 it says that was built by high place at every head of the way and has made thy beauty to be a board and has opened thy feet to everyone that passed by and multiplied thy whoredoms. So these, these eminent and high places, were, which were dedicated to the worship of heathen gods, designed to glorify the idol associated with it, were everywhere in the land of Judah. The, and the sad thing is, and of course he started out by talking about causing Jerusalem uh, to know her abominations. And what's so sad is the, the, the very place where God had chosen to place his name there, Jerusalem, that special place of all the places on the earth, God had chosen to place his name right there in Jerusalem. And they had filled it with these high places to these pagan deities. They weren't content with a few such places but they caused them to be found in every public square and the head of every thoroughfare. So it seemed like wherever you went in the city, there were these high places to these idols. And then he says, uh, and it's quite a, again, you can see why this was not to be read publicly. Open thy feet to everyone that passed by. At the thought We would say it this way today, that, that this woman was so loose that she opened her legs to anyone that came by. That's the idea. It's the idea of completely given over to debauchery. And that's how the nation had become. And so he's using shocking language because he wants to jolt the hearers, right? He's trying to get these people's attention, let them realize how solemn and serious their sin was. And so he uses such graphic language because it's for effect. It's to get their attention. And so notice in verse 26, he says, Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. So this section, as we've said, deals with uh, their lust for foreign idols, but also their lust for foreign allegiances. And again, we could say New Testament wise, like how do we apply all this? Well, James, I think, does it very nicely in James 4, verse 4, uh, writing to the Lord's people in this new dispensation. And sadly, he says this to them, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so we can see that there is relevance to this, right? Looking at Ezekiel 16 has relevance to you and I. Are we adulterers? Are we, uh, instead of looking to the Lord as our sustainer, the one that supplies for us, the one that cares for us, the one that is our husband and protector, the looking to the Lord as it were, the heavenly bridegroom, or are we captivated by the world and running after it and its values? Because this is what's going on in Judah, and this is what can happen with God's people. And uh, it's true to say that it's very easy for all of us to be caught up with the world's politics, the world's entertainment, the world's sport, 
These things can have a great appeal to God's people to such a degree that it causes us to neglect him who has done so much for us. And so we have to just examine our own hearts, right? This is, it's easy to preach this about them, <laughs> but what about you and I? Where's, where is our heart? And so he, he, he talks about going after the, the Egyptians and notice what he says about them. It's kind of interesting, the language that he uses about them. Uh, and he, he calls them great of flesh. <laughs> yeah. And of course, it, yeah, it gives you an idea of the repugnance uh, that both Ezekiel and the Lord have towards Egypt. He says they're great of flesh. Uh, they're, they're a place where uh, th the flesh can be indulged uh, in, to all its gratification, so to speak. And of course, that's what the world is designed for, right? Egypt is a type of the world in Scripture. And so when we think about being captivated by the world, what is, is, is it in us that is captivated by the world? It's our flesh. The world is a place to find fulfillment for the, the energy of the flesh. That's why it exists. That's what it's there for. That's what it appeals to. And so he talks about Egypt being large of flesh. It's very great of flesh. And so um, it's, it's interesting how the word of God warns us about going to Egypt or the world for our help. And I want you just to look at a couple of references. Look at Isaiah 30. They're both close together, one in Isaiah 30, one in Isaiah 31. But it's, again, another woe pronounced again. So he says in verse 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3 of Isaiah 30, and then verse 1 of Isaiah 31. It says this, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, so they look for their advice, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt, Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. So they were looking to Egypt, the council for help in everything that they were doing. Chapter 31, verse one, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. And they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. And so you can see this. Their, their, their appeal is to Egypt. They're looking to Egypt. But what about the church? How often does the professing church in our world turn towards Egypt? Again, ever a type of the world. We have worldly music, entertainment, woke ideas that are coming into the professing church, uh, worldly fundraising techniques, worldly wisdom, looking to psychology and psychoanalysts and all of this stuff. And so I, I would say today, the church in general, we're thinking, and I'm not just speaking of the un unbelieving, professing what we call Christendom, but even evangelicalism so often is looking to worldly ideas for success rather than to the Lord. And so uh, you have all the kind of modern techniques of church growth and all of this. In, instead of coming into the presence of God and say, Lord, unless you build the house, we're laboring in vain in building it and crying out to God to help us, we look at worldly ideas. And, and so uh, there's so much worldliness, sadly, in the church of the Lord Jesus today that it's confusing with confusing it with Egypt. And it really is tragic. And so again, it, woe to those that go to Egypt for help. And so here, here is Judah, and it's, it's again, committing uh, whoredom, and doing it with Egypt. Thou also has committed fornication with the Egyptians, 
thy neighbor's greater flesh and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Verse 27, behold, therefore I have stretched out my hand over thee and have diminished thine ordinary food and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. So the Lord began to lay his hand heavily upon Judah, diminishing her ordinary food. Interesting, isn't it? And I would suggest to you that the more we look to Egypt, the less real spiritual food is seen in the church. And so you find today a lot of kind of mega church kind of mentality where they have lots of entertainment, kind of a so-called worship team, and they're leading them all. And then they'll have some kind of little kind of mini sermon, very little exposition. The ordinary food of the church is being continually diminished. And I think it's a judgment of God upon the church for turning our back on the Lord. And it's a tragedy. And that is the way it's become. And so... Uh, the Lord laid his hand heavily upon her, diminishing her food. And then even the Philistines, that old enemy, became ashamed of her lewd practice. Now, isn't that a tragic thing? When the Philistines look at God's people, Judah, and say about them, they're, they're terribly lewd in their conduct. <laughs> and that's, that's, a, that's a shock, isn't it? And, and the context is, is, is simply this that when a child of God wanders from the Lord, it even amazes unbelievers and excites their contempt. They expect better things. They expect better standards from those of us that profess to know the Lord. And, and when they see us acting like the world, being like the world, it just, their contempt and disdain is very clearly seen. So the context of this uh, is that God has removed from her her supply of divine favor, which had brought her to this place of eminence. Uh, she's been diminished. God is diminishing her. Uh, and he's doing it um, for a simple reason, and that is that he wants her to come to repentance. He wants her to come back to him. And so he begins to, as it were, diminish her. And of course, uh, the weakness of the church should drive us to our knees and drive us in repentance for our worldliness and drive us back to the Lord. And he certainly is diminishing us. Uh, we can see the diminishing of the, uh, the, the evangelical testimony in America is very clearly seen. And so the Lord is beginning to diminish us. And so as a result of that, does that drive us to seek the Lord? and to seek him as the one that is going to build and going to change things. But verse 28, he says, Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, yet couldst, couldst not be satisfied. So let's think about friendship with Assyria. And again, we see examples of this. Second Kings 16. We have King Ahaz and both Ahaz and Manasseh, both of them uh, making alliances with Assyria. And of course, along with this comes adopting their worship and their ideas. And so, for instance, in 2 Kings 16, verse 7, it says, So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up. Save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. So here's a king of Judah. And where is he going for help? He's not turning to the Lord. He's turning to Assyria to come and help him. And what, what is the net result of this? Look at verse 15 of the same chapter. It says, And King Ahaz commanded Urijah, the priest, saying, Upon the great altar, 
burn the morning burnt offering and the evening meat offering and the king's burnt sacrifice and his meat offering and the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meat offering and their drink offering and sprinkle upon it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire of there. Now, what is this brazen altar that all this stuff is to be burnt on? Look at verse 14. He brought also the brazen altar, which was before the Lord from the forefront of the house from between the altar and the house of the Lord and put it on the north side of the altar. And what does he replace it with? He replaces it with a copy of the altar that he had seen in Assyria. Verse 11 says, Elijah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Elijah the priest made it against King Ahaz uh, came from Damascus. So basically, in getting involved in Assyria, they begin to adopt Assyrian worship. And so, and yet it tells us, and of course, uh, we also see uh, not just uh, the story of Ahaz, we see it with King Manasseh as well, uh, doing the very same thing. But what is amazing is that um, as they get involved with, with Assyria, it still tells us that at the end of it all, they're not satisfied. And I want you to notice that again. He says, verse 28, Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians because thou was unsatiable. It was just couldn't get enough of these illicit relationships. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them. And then notice this, yet couldst not be satisfied. I want you just to, to think about this for a moment, because um, despite her insatiable desire for foreign lovers, yet she remains unsatisfied. And it raises an important question. Can a child of God find genuine satisfaction in sin and in the world? And we often sing the amazing words, I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they fled and mocked me as I wailed. Now none but Christ can satisfy, none other name for me, there's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus, found in thee. And I just want to say this, that it's folly to look anywhere else than to the Lord Jesus to satisfy the human heart. Sin, even though we may have an insatiable appetite for it, never satisfies there's always this longing for more. There's all. There's never a sense where you feel like you've you've had enough, and yet, with Christ, we can find true satisfaction. And so again, it's just good to remind us of these things. That the world can't satisfy your heart. Uh, the uh, the things of the flesh can never satisfy your heart. And uh, we see this. That's why we talk about people with addictions. And, and, and the idea is this, that they're just not satisfied. <laughs> they have to have more, more of the same, more of the same, more of the same. And so it's, again, it's showing that these things can never satisfy. And so let's notice um, in verse uh, 30, uh, oh, sorry, verse 29, he says, Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou was not satisfied. So now friendship with Babylon. And of course, most unlikely source, but here's a, another king of Judah, 2 Kings 20, who is making alliances and friendships with the Chaldeans. And this is none other than godly king Hezekiah. And yet it tells us in 2 Kings 20, verse 12, at that time, Beradak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and presents to Hezekiah. For he heard that Hezekiah had been sick, and Hezekiah hearkened unto them. 
and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, precious ointment, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures there was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. And we go on, and of course, he becomes enamored with Babylon and ends up the very nation that he's represented is going to go into captivity to, to Babylon. And so again, friendship with the Chaldeans. And so we see this Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians. They're, they're just insatiable for these, uh, both depending upon them and also uh, adopting their gods as part of the package, which is usually what goes on. So notice verse 30, he says, how weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. The expression of God's sorrow at their conduct is this. How weak is your heart? It suggests a weak will, particularly in uh, settling the mind and heart on right things. He's really saying this, the problem is a heart problem. Sick, unbridled, without control in her lust. God saw that the problems with Judah went far deeper than their actions. Their heart had become proud and dissatisfied with their covenant God. This decline was truly degenerate that was going on. And so he says it really comes down to the heart. And again, it's true, isn't it? A divided heart <laughs> is the problem. And it's good to ask ourselves, where is our heart? Are, are we in love with our Savior, the Lord Jesus? Or are we in love with him and also with the world? Is it a divided heart? And so what he wants is our whole heart. Love the Lord your God with, what does it say? All your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Not part of it, all of it. God wants us all. He, want, he wants us to be truly loyal to the heavenly bridegroom, to have no other uh, others that pull away our affections from him. So it's a heart problem. Verse 31, and it says, And that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and has not been as an harlot, in that thou scornest higher. So here, here's a ridiculous statement in a sense, but he says, usually a prostitute is in the business for money. She usually gets paid for her services. Yet she, the wife of Jehovah, scorned higher. She preferred strangers to her own husband and even ended up paying them for their services rather than the other way around. And so he says uh, that you're, you're a very different type of harlot uh, it, that you, you scorn higher. It's a tremendous piece of sarcasm. Ezekiel portrays Israel literally as a, uh, a, a sex-mad, promiscuous woman whose lust has caused her to reverse the order involved in prostitution. She has hired rather than being hired by her clients. And so what, what a terrible thing to have said about Judah. But verse 32, as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. And it really comes down to the fact that they've lost their love for him. And they're looking elsewhere to find satisfaction. Verse 33, they give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers and hirest them that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. So she's like a, a, an adulterous wife who not only gives herself away for free, but also buys lavish gifts for her illicit lovers using her husband's wealth to do it at her husband's expense. She gave gifts to all her lovers. And what we, we could say by way of application, I'm not sure I've got this quote correctly. Uh, I, I know... Uh, uh, Brother Angelo said that he has got a list of quotes, so maybe he can correct us after the meeting. But this is a quotation I heard a long time ago, but I'm not sure I'm remembering it correctly, but it goes like this. Sin always costs you more than you want to pay. 
It takes you further than you want to go, and it leaves you longer than you want to stay. And so the idea is this, that there's a high cost to departing from the Lord. Sin is expensive. Uh, sin is expensive. It's degrading. It's disgusting. Uh, it, it doesn't satisfy, and it takes you away from the one who really loves you. And their consequences are huge. Verse 34, he says, And the contrary is in thee from other women, in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. Again, it's continuing this metaphor of harlotry. And so often, uh, when you have people who are uh, involved in prostitution, there's usually what's called a pimp who basically is kind of their controller. And what God is saying here is you don't have anybody following you, making you do this. You're doing this of your own volition. There's nobody making you do this. It's not like you're being trafficked or anything like that. You're doing this of your own volition. That's the picture here. And so Israel had no pimp. She was not forced or persuaded to do what she did. It came from her degenerate heart. That's really what he's saying to them. Even though it cost her, because she gave payment, she can still continued to be unfaithful to her God. Now, one commentator says this, and I, I think it's interesting what he said. He says, but the church today, is the church today any less guilty? Members of local churches commit the same sins we read about in the newspapers, but the news doesn't always get to the headlines. Congregations are being torn apart because of professed Christians who are involved in lawsuits, Divorces, immorality, family feuds, crooked business deals, financial scandals, and a host of other activities that belong to the world. Challenging, huh? <laughs> the world, in a sense, the church is, is uh, becoming just like them. So we move on to, uh, from verse 35 through 43, we're now in a new section, which is the sentence for her crimes. This is God's passing judgment on her because of this insatiable and unsatisfied lust that is seen in her. And so verse 35, wherefore, here's, here's where we get down to the nitty gritty. As a, as a result of what we've seen so far, uh, this very hard passage to think about, to meditate on, he says, wherefore, O harlot, so he's addressing the harlot directly. And again, imagine this, God addressing his people. And he says, oh, harlot, what, what language that he has to use. And so he says, oh, harlot, hear the word of the Lord. And so he says in verse 36, and again, I, I apologize that this is not the most pleasant message you will ever hear on a Friday morning. <laughs> I apologize for it. But when we're dealing with a text, we have to deal with a text, including what it says. And so it says in verse 36, Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. So this phrase, thy filthiness was poured out. It's a very strong expression indicating that she had engaged in the most shameful of sexual acts. The underlying charge is, of course, that of spiritual departure, but engaging in the practices of heathen idolatry also led to indulgence in the physical depravity that was connected with those rituals. Most commentators believe that this, thy filthiness, is really a reference to the issue of venereal disease. This is what they say. The filthiness issuing from thee by reason of thine overly frequent and excessive adulteries, he means the infamous fluxes of whores, 
properly translated in our version, filthiness, poisonous filth, does not refer, uh, does it not refer to that venereal virus which is engendered by promiscuous connections? Wow, it's kind of sobering, isn't it? And of course, that's that's the thing we have to realize too, that not only is sin expensive, sin is very dangerous because you're playing games with things that God says you shouldn't be doing. And there are consequences. One of the consequences is unimaginably painful, difficult diseases that come along with promiscuity. And so he talks about their filthiness that, uh, and thy nakedness is covered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers, the blood of thy children. Of course, children are also affected by this, aren't they? It's kind of interesting that um, some of these diseases are transmittable to children. So again, very, very sobering. Verse 37, behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure and all them that ha thou hast loved with all them that thou hast uh, that thou hast hated, I will even gather them round about against thee and will discover thy nakedness unto them that they may see all their na thy nakedness. So the first step of the process of God's judgment upon them was her public exposure before her lovers and her enemies. The gathering of a large company points to the invasion and destruction in 586 BC. Her lovers would be her executioners. So we said she had gone after the Chaldeans. Well, who's going to be responsible for the judgment? Well, the Chaldeans, but there's going to be others that are going to join with them. When we get to the part of Ezekiel where he talks to the other nations that are going to join and help in this, in this process. Appropriate, appropriately, it's Israel's lovers who will execute God's vengeance upon her. By that, they add to the depths of her shame. They show how cheaply they had valued what she had to offer and the real contempt in which they held her. God promises to humble, even to humiliate Israel before her pagan neighbors. The beauty and adornment she had traded upon before the nations would be stripped away and they would see what Israel was without God. In other words, she's going to be completely all of the wealth that she used to buy her lovers, which would come to her from the, the goodness of God and his care for her. He's going to strip it all away. She's going to have nothing. She's going to be like she was when she started, as it were, naked without anything when God first found her. And uh, then they, people will see what Israel was without God. And by the way, what would we be without God? Any, any graces that are seen in our lives, any gifts that are seen in our lives, anything that is uh, useful <laughs> comes from him, right? I am what I am by the grace of God, Paul says. And so we got to remind ourselves, take all that away, and we're no better than anybody else. We're no different to any other man. So <clears throat> this wasn't shame for the sake of shame. This was for the sake of repentance and restoration. Again, that's what the Lord is doing. Doing this for the sake of repentance and restoration. And so very, very sobering. Jerusalem had bared her body to all passerbys. Now God provides her with all the exposure she wants. And more, if she wants to be a public spectacle, he offers his aid. Naked he had found her, naked he would leave her. The hell that awaited her was not the creation of some demonic force or external power, but of her own making. And so she's going to reap what she had sold. Verse 38. It says, and I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood in fury and je jealousy. So she'll be tried, first of all, as an adulteress, as a woman that breaks wedlock. And then secondly, as a murderer, I will give thee blood in fury. 
a wedlock and shed blood are judged. So somebody who shed blood, of course, that was for killing her children uh, to Moloch. So she's basically tried as an adulteress and as a murderer for the execution of her children. Again, it takes us back, uh, and we've made many a visit to Leviticus, to the, the original covenant that they entered into with the Lord and his promises to them if they failed to keep it, if they failed to keep their side of the, the covenant relationship. And so we find Leviticus 20, verse 10, it says this, uh, and the man which committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Again, we see the same thing in Deuteronomy. And so this God is going to judge her, he says, as an adulteress. 22 of Deuteronomy and verse 23 and 24 it says, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to another husband, to unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then she shall bring them both out in then you shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, and you shall stone them with stones that they die, the damsel because she cried not, being in the city, and the man because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. So again we get this idea, adulterous to be stoned and of course uh, uh, to be put to death and of course the penalty was stoning we see that don't we in john 8 uh, the woman caught in adultery uh, she was to be stoned to death because she'd been caught in the act of adultery and that was the penalty that would come upon them now the murderer again back in exodus and of course she she had murdered her children by offering them to Molech and was guilty and therefore, God was going to judge her for her guilt. Chapter 21 and verse 12, we read this. It says, and he that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. Verse 14, but if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. And so both the penalty of stoning and the penalty of the sword will come upon this nation. So notice again, he says, I'm going to judge you, verse 38. Verse 39, I will also give thee unto their hand, and they shall throw down thine eminent places, shall break down thy high places, they shall strip thee also of thy clothes, shall take their fa their, thy fair jewels, leave thee naked and bare, they shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones, and thrust thee through with their swords. So the invading army, first of all, is going to come. And, they, and of course, when they lay siege to the city, one of the things that they would use is giant catapults that would throw stones into the city. And so just like the, the, the one woman caught in adultery to be stoned, God is going to bring to death uh, some of them through these giant catapults, destroying their eminent places. And of course, also swords will be involved. Uh, God will use the sword to execute them. They'll be stripped naked of all her remaining wealth, her fine clothes, her jewels, leaving her naked and bare like she was at the beginning when her husband found her. God would bring the punishment of death upon Israel. He would not kill all the nation completely, but rain death upon them in judgment. God promised to bring this judgment with passion. And so that's the language that he's using here that he intends to do, to use passion to bring about their judgment. Of course, uh, verse 41 says, they shall burn thine houses with fire and execute judgment upon thee in the sight of many women. And I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot and thou also shalt give no hire any more. So the burning of the city would cause her to cease to be a harlot any more. The captivity would once and for all cure her from her idolatry and whoredoms. The judgment God would bring upon them would be something of a cure for Israel's gross idolatry. After this judgment and exile, they would never have the same problems with idols of the nations as they had before. And we do know that, don't we, that after 
the Babylonian captivity, you never read of the Jews being involved in idolatry. Now, now we know they have other problems. They reject their Messiah, but they're never, ever involved in idolatry after this. God cures them of it once and for all. And so verse 42 says, So will I make my fury toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet, and will be no more angry. And so God is basically saying that his anger as the jealous husband would be finally abated. His, his anger against Israel was not to last forever. When their hearts were turned away from their gross idolatry, God would change his disposition towards them once again. And so he would come to rest. His, his idolatry would come to an end or his uh, anger would come to an end against their idolatry. Verse 43, again, it's where we started. Our study th this morning is where we end here. Verse 43, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. This is the root cause. This is why all the problems, they had forgotten what the Lord had done for them. Her troubles is because she had forgotten the Lord's goodness. He's repeating what he said in verse 22. Their self-destructive pride was based on their failure to remember that all the good they had was a blessing and a gift from God. In order that she might remember them once again, God would bring this discipline on her. Though mankind may forget God, his love prevents him from forgetting his own. God takes his commitments in personal relationships very seriously. And it's so wonderful to know that he is faithful to his commitments <laughs> and his covenants, and we can trust him and depend him for that. So what we could say is this, and again, this is a good place to, to end our session this morning. We could say this, that for you and I, the lesson is very stark. And that is this, that the minute we forget what God has done for us, where we've come from, what he saved us out of, what he's brought us into, all the, the love and grace that has been lavished upon us, if we forget that, then it's a slippery slope that leads to spiritual adultery. And so what we could say is this, and we've said it before, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I for forget thy love to me, lead me to Calvary. Brethren, ever keep us near the cross. Never let us forget what the Lord has done for people like us. Because if we do, <laughs> it's a dangerous, dangerous place. May God encourage us with these things. Amen.